Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the Melbourne Jewish Book Week, second Tuesday of the month feature event. And what a treat we have for you tonight. I'm Nicholas Brash, Director of the Melbourne Jewish Book Week. And I'd just like to start by respectfully acknowledging that the land that we are on always was, always will be Indigenous land. And I pay my respect to Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging. Tonight we cross the Pacific um, and greet Michael Twitty uh, and thank him for being up and about at about 4.30 a.m. his time. Michael is an African-American Jewish writer, culinary historian and author of the award wicket winning the, the, the Cooking Gene. Uh, and he's going to be talking to Melbourne-based writer and editor Alyssa Goldstein about how he explores um, identity and history through food. And it's a fascinating um, uh, um, issue for his conversation. His stories and the history um, are amazing. Um, if you have any questions for Michael, uh, please post them in the Q&A section that you can find near the bottom of your screen. However, please note, we usually get more questions that we can ask. And I suspect with only an hour, um, and knowing that both Alyssa and Michael's um, enthusiasm for what's about to take place, there may only be room for a couple of them. Um, I want to get straight into this, but please don't log off when Michael and Alyssa have finished. Our, our next three events are all different to some of our recent offerings. And I just want to share my excitement about them with you at the end and tell you about them. Um, but now let's get straight into it. For now, it's over to you, Alyssa. Thanks, Nick, um, and welcome, everyone. So I just want to begin by giving a more fulsome explanation of um, Michael's work, just because you've done so much over the years. Um, I am just going to make sure I can see you. Yes, now I can see you. So Michael, you're an independent writer and scholar and much of your work, whether it's your books or your blog posts or your very funny tweets, centers around your identity as a black gay Jewish man who is really engaged with the question of where our food comes from and what our food means on a spiritual, political and historical level. You've been publishing your work on your blog, Afro Culinaria, since 2011, where you explore the food ways of the American South, African Americans and the Jewish and African diasporas and how your identity exists at the intersection of all those traditions. You're also a former Judaic studies teacher. You're a historical interpreter, which for um, listeners tuning in who might not be familiar with that term involves dressing in period attire at historical sites, which includes plantations, uh, where you prepare historically accurate meals using the same methods and ingredients that your ancestors who were enslaved used in an effort to educate people about the history of food in the South and to prompt an open and honest reckoning with racism and the legacy of slavery, all of which of course shape contemporary American cuisine. In 2012, you embarked on your Southern Discomfort Tour where you traveled to former slave holding states to research your family history and to cook, eat and engage with dialogue, in dialogue with people from all backgrounds about your work and also to conduct some deep research into your own genealogy. Now, on the topic of genealogy, I didn't realise this before I started your book, but you are an avid genealogist and you spent a great deal of time researching your ancestors and your genetic history, following it all the way back to West Africa, which you have visited several times. And all of this work and research culminates in your 2017 book, The Cooking Gene, which I'll just hold up here for viewers. <laughs> Um, the subtitle is A Journey Through African American Culinary History in the Old South, and it won the James Beard Award in 2018 for Best Food Writing and Book of the Year, which is basically the Oscars of food writing. So it doesn't get bigger than that. And you made history as the first Black author to do so. So mazel tov, and welcome to Melbourne. Ta -da -da. Um, I hope I hope I've covered everything. Um, I think it's really better than most people. I'm very impressed. Yeah, I, I think it's really essential for people who aren't familiar with your work and who are encountering you for the first time to have that full picture to mm -hmm. sort of understand the conversation that's going to follow. Um, and I just want to begin on a personal note by saying that this book is one of the most engaging memoirs and nonfiction narratives I've ever read. Um, it's sort of like a shorthand for understanding the history of the United States, I think. It's really essential wow. reading. Um, and I just highly recommend reading it, buying it, downloading the audiobook, which you read. I 
listen to your dulcet tones for 15 <laughs> little hours because um, I read it and, and listened to it as well. Anyway, so I wanted to begin with my first question, which is why is this book called The Cooking Gene? What do food and genetics have to do with each other and how do they come together for you? Okay, so I get re I've gotten really tired of people writing me going, Dear Chef Jean, when clearly my name is on the book, I'm like, Jean, I've never been no Jean. Um, I think that it's, well, first of all, I, I, I never thought that this is going to be the title for, for a project that I've been trying to put together in various ways since I was very young. I mean, this was always the dream. I was gonna, I was gonna write a book about the South, the whole South. I was gonna write a book where, you know, in the in the mode of one of my um, great heroes, Alex Haley, and tell that story. I was gonna fill in the blank, and all of it came together with this book. And I chose the title, "The Cooking Gene," because um, it's a it's kind of a phrase, an American phrase. Like I don't have, I have or don't have the cooking gene. Um, you know. I don't know what it's like in Oz, but it's like the kind of idea that some people can, you know, can't boil water and some people can whip up a whole meal out of nothing. Yeah. Um, and that having the cooking gene means that, you know, you've got that spark, you, you can cook a home meal, you can be a chef, whatever you want. Um, but I, I explained in the book that I don't literally mean that genetics is key to cook. I, that's, yeah. But I also wanted to play on the idea that having your genetic family tree as well as your documented um, written family tree are both component parts, especially if you're African-American. I don't know how much people know, but um, there were no manifests. There were no, we, unless we were written down as property, there was, there was really, there's no trail. Mm. Um, and the culture I wouldn't, I, I don't go as far as a lot of other people say when they say the culture was obliterated or stolen or taken, not all of it, but a significant amount of the things that we, that, you know, most cultures depend upon. So I, so in order to figure out where I came from, I did more than one DNA test, more than one genetic, geneal genetic genealogy excursion um, to come up with that answer. And, I, and also I was just like, well, if I find out come from, different places what in what in me what in my own personal style drive ambition um survival skills and what in my food reflects that you know it, it's you know i've been to eight different west african countries on seven trips i hope to do more after the pandemic is is flattened and and for me it's like okay i'm retrieving this part of my past that i was never supposed to have and then, you know, most people can go, well, my family is from Minsk. My family is from, um, is Litvak. My family is this, my family is that. And if you know that part and you know the rest of the history, you can sort of piece it together. Well, that's what I had to do in this, in this case. Um, so I wanna just sort of touch on what I, the, uh, a thread in your book that I picked up that was really about spirituality and the sacredness of your work um, mm. in a lot of ways, particularly when you are preparing to go to cook on a plantation. You write in the first chapter of the book um, about this ritual that you put on the quote unquote representative clothes and you start at the fire and you write, I like burning a little raw cotton with the pine and her needles. It feels like poetic justice my own little taste of revenge. I know that's silly, but I am captive to those blood memory visions of the cotton bales burning and the soldiers marching on and Jubilee coming. Nothing ever really escapes memory and the things we forget often are condemned to it. And the thing that really struck me when I went back to read this chat, this section again, is that it's published under the subtitle Morning Prayer, which, you know, if you're a Jewish reader, you read those words mm -hmm. and you immediately think of Shachrit, which has mm -hmm. its own kind of, representative clothes and ablutions and rituals. Um, and I also found myself thinking in also in a very biblical sense of the descriptions of Aharon, the high priest in the Torah, all the vestments that he puts on before he goes to do his holy work. And I was just wondering, you know, and, and you also mentioned in that same section of the book about 
referring to being now we are slaves in the land of Egypt, you know, that right. embodiment of history. I was just curious if you could speak to, I, I wasn't expecting that part of your work to be so spiritual before I started reading the book. But then when I read it, that was what really stood out to me. And I was just wondering if you, how you experience it internally and if you can speak to what that is like and, and its connection to Judaism, if any. I, I love that you picked up on that because it was, in, you know, the best, some of the best symbolism and, and interplay in an author's work is when the author does not realize it themselves. Mm. And for me, you know, using terms like morning prayer, well, you know, there's, there's a lot of Judaism, there's Islam, there is certainly traditional African religion and spirituality, there is uh, the, the Afro-Baptist tradition, but essentially chakras, yeah. Mm. And um, beyond that, it's, it's, I, I, the whole, you know, one of the parts of the, the sitter that I like really pay, like paid attention to, and I was wondering, okay, how does this, how does this apply is the whole section talking about the Korban. Mm. And so all of that, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't like, oh, I need to make this look like, I just feel that's what I, I just move through my brain as I do that. Um, and I think people need to understand. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in a. I'm not in the um, um, third person. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not in the first person when I interpret. I'm a. I'm a museum professional. Mm. I'm not a. I'm not putting on an act. I'm not. You know, reciting a script. Mm. And of course, it says. You know, in the Haggadah, the pa pa Pesach is my favorite holiday. Mm. And then it says in the Haggadah, you know, now we are enslaved. Now we are. You know it makes you feel the presence mm. of what it what it meant to be in bondage, to be oppressed, to be marginalized. And then the entire span of human existence, especially Jewish existence, is to come from under that shadow. Mm. So um, to me, and, it, and, it, and it, I'm so glad, I'm, I, I have to reread it now that you said that. Mm. Cause you know, authors, they don't, we don't touch our stuff. Mm. Once it's done, we, mm. ugh, you know? Because yeah. you know, you know that you know all the things that you missed and mistakes you made. And you're very self-conscious, and also just there's that there's that feeling and there's that postpartum thing when you just like let to leave behind this 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 child, this thing that you brought into the world. But for me, like I I know I got a lot of stuff for being Jewish. Um, and it wasn't from the publisher; it was from other publishers I'm trying to market to especially one that told me, nah, you can't wear a keep on public and you can't talk about Judaism in this book. And it infuriated me because, you know, intersectionality means that all the parts are woven together like a challah. You know what I'm saying? You don't take one braid of the challah out and then, you know, expect the challah to be whole. And I think people's um, fear of someone like me talking about Judaism like, I don't think they, it, it was weird because I'm telling you, my sister, I, I don't think that they trusted me. They trusted me to be, you know, um, in control of the narrative. And I'm like, I live this narrative. I taught kids for God's sakes. You know, I, sur I survived teaching year seven uh, Hebrew school for how many years? I have the gray hairs to prove it. <laughs> so if anybody on this call has <clears throat> connections to the no Nobel Peace Prize Committee, <laughs> then I, I just definitely deserve that medal because of the the <clears throat> the um, pictures that I taught for many, many years. But I, you know, I did more than that. And, and it's all those lived experiences come into what I do. I can't separate them apart. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another, um, actually, you know, before I go with my next question, I'd love to get you to read an excerpt from the book. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and so there was the one that I'd mentioned to you earlier um, yeah. from the chapter titled Mishpacha. Right. And maybe right. Just before you commence, do you want to like just set the scene a little bit so that listeners know where this is taking place in the narrative? Sure. I really, <clears throat> excuse me, I really wanted to, after having all these haggling, awful knockdown drag out fights over what gets to be in this book, um, and I'm and I'm lucky. The best thing, and the most thing I'm most proud about, is the fact that for the most part, 99%, all these different parts of me are in here. And um, 
I don't, I don't want people to, I want people to understand that, you know, for me to fight for Jewish representation, what that means to me and, and the, the fluidity of this and how it fits in all parts of my life. I, by doing that, I'm resisting the idea that, you, that to be Jewish to be in a is to be in a bubble. No more than to be black and to be gay, be Southern is to be in a bubble, in a box that people can put you in. No, it's, it's about self-definition. That's what power is. And so what I'm doing here in this part of this chapter, the very end of Mishpacha, is to really talk about the complexity of Southern Jewish life. Um, I want everybody in Australia to know that the South had Charleston, Savannah on the coast of east, east southeastern coast of America, which were two of the largest Jewish colonial settlements. When I say that, I don't mean five people. I mean, it's substantial communities in both places where they put up a really big, beautiful synagogue and they had a thriving community life. And until, until sometime a chunk into the early 1800s, maybe 1810, maybe 1820, no, no areas of the country had more Jews than Charleston and Savannah. Not, not New York, but New York, Philadelphia comes next. And then of course, New York and then New York takes over from the time the Germans arrive, German Jews arrive onward. So there's that. And then there's other issues like the civil rights movement, et cetera. So I'll just read it for you. I'm gonna get some water because it takes water to do this. And it's very early in the morning. So water break. Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> Blacks and Jews have had some of their more, more tenuous and passive aggressive relationships in the American South. Some Jews participated in the South's evils of slavery and slave trading and supplied the system with its staples. Yet they were nowhere near as represented as their Christian neighbors in the scales of oppression and others were active in the denunciation of slavery. Some Jewish slaveholders were no more likely to be understanding or humane, and others were deeply different in their approach towards enslaved blacks among them. A cursory look at the free Negro registries of Charleston shows a preponderance of mulattoes with the names of Cohen, Levy, and the like. In New Orleans and Savannah, Levy, Sheftals, and other families also emancipated and left descendants of color through whose veins the blood of Africa, the Middle East, and Europe flowed. The first kosher soul cookery might have begun among black women cooking for Jewish families on plantations or by way of these black Jewish families in the early Southern coastal cities. I have always described Birmingham as my grandparents' Poland. It was a place to escape from, not endure in. Their parents came there to get away from the oppression of the cotton field, but it was only a slight step up. I tell the audience, I've never thought I'd come back here to Alabama or to see my, the city my maternal grandparents grew up in. I don't know what to look for. The people I want to ask about where my, fam, where my family came from are gone. I don't know my true place here. At the end of the program, people volunteered their stories to me. A Southern lesbian of Scotch-Irish heritage told me about her journey. She was the keeper of the family recipe box which had belonged to her in name only, her name only mother-in-law and partner who recently died of breast cancer. She had converted to Judaism and attended shul faithfully and became the Jewish culinary memory of her partner's family. She confessed new additions here and there, including beef bones and a chicken broth for matzo ball soup. She and I were both gay, both Southern, both Jewish, both converts and both avid cooks. There was immediate familiar sin or familyness. Shortly thereafter, two older women, heavily accented, stepped forward to shake my hand. Ruth Siegler and Ilsa Nathan are sisters. They love the Southern tea cake dough hamantaschen and asked after the recipe. We came here after the war from Germany. We were some of the only people in our family to survive the war. But you know, we saw the black, what the black people were going through here and we did what we had to do. We drove people around during boycotts. We got them to register to vote. Ilsa chimes in, we're glad what we did, we're glad we did what we had to do because you had to come back to Alabama. She kissed me on the cheek, you're a mishpucha. I was chilled to the bone. I had come back 
to the place my grandmother of blessed memory was born in to find my Macomb. And for those who don't know, Macomb is not only place, but it's a euphemism for the presence of the living God. So yeah. Beautiful, thanks Michael. Thank um, so that, I love that excerpt. It just, it contains so much in it. Um, and it sort of leads me into my next question because as I was reading your book, I was thinking a lot about the psychic and spiritual journey of um, familial trauma and what it means to go to the place, either literally or in your imagination where your people have been persecuted. And, you know, I found myself relating to it on a personal level. I thought of my own grandparents who were Holocaust survivors mm. and my own experience, you know, I've been to Poland, I've been to the shtetl where their family were killed. I've seen the concentration camps that they were interned in. And I've got to say, um, it's really hard being in those spaces. And to some extent, I have the benefit of distance of being in Australia. I'm far away from it, geographically speaking, even though I think about it all the time. Um, but you go to that place a lot physically, you know, as well as imaginatively. Um, and I guess what I was wondering is how, how do you find the strength to do that? And when mm. you come out of sort of doing that work, I guess, what, what is your aftercare? How do you look after yourself? How do you not feel overwhelmed mm. by it? What a brilliant question. Um, and it's something I didn't think about until a long time after, a long time. Um, I started to notice a couple of things. Uh, and I, and for those of, those of you who are on this um, call presentation, I want you to understand, if you're not metaphysical, what I'm about to say is not gonna make any sense to you. If, if, the, if that side of the human existence is not really your thing, I do apologize, but I can only answer Alyssa's question in these terms. So um, when you go to these places, the first thing you feel is dread. The, you know, and I, and I, wanna, I wanna make sure everybody understands these, the difference between somebody going to Auschwitz-Birkenau and somebody going to Monticello, uh, Monticello is home of Thomas Jefferson. It's a plantation. A lot of people were beaten there. People were sexually violated there. People were sold there. Um, even, even if it was one of the nicer <laughs> plantations, I mean, that doesn't, does, that doesn't make much sense to you, right? It's like the idea of, oh, it was a nice slaveholder. It was a nice, it was one of the nice ones. Okay, the nice ones were still pretty, pretty uh, awful. Um, no matter what they tried to do. It just wasn't, it, it, it was still human chattel. If someone, someone could be as nice as they wanted to be their entire life to their enslaved people and have compassion, but still consider them animals. Let's think, let's, let's be real about this. I never do a thing to them, but the minute they, the minute they stop breathing and stop living, guess who got liquidated to pay their debts? Our families got broken up. Mothers from their children fathers from their wives, husbands from their wives, grandparents from their grandchildren, I mean, sold apart to the highest bidder. In fact, uh, last weekend or the weekend before, we had the anniversary of what was called the weeping time. And that was the largest uh, slave auction in American history where over 436 black people were sold apart in the course of two to three days to pay the, the largest slaveholder in America's debts in a rice plantation. Um, Jefferson, the same deal. I mean, they loved him to a point. He still had people who ran away, et cetera. Then he died and all of a sudden all that money he had invested in wine and, 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 and fun stuff and travel, the bills came due and to pay the bills, the people were sold. All right, just so people know. And then you go to these plantations in America and it's all gone with the wind fantasy. They do their best to tell that story over and over, and they're, and they're they're literally guys. They're literally uh, hundreds of them, and when they and if it's not a plantation, they name a piece of land, high priced land, a co like a condos and gate, gated communities and golf courses after plantations. So this is not like this is literally like a juxtaposition of on the one hand, look at these glorious antebellum and colonial mansions and beautiful trees and flowers and grounds, versus this is where massive the labor of, of many people and their lives were 
you know, brokered to make all that possible and to build it. Okay. So then I come in and when this place, when these places are museums as opposed to private houses, then it's my job to, to bring to life the stories of the enslaved people there and teach people about their, and this is not a guilt, this is not guilt fest. For me, it's, it's, for me, it's very important for people to realize that the damage was done, but we can elevate ourselves by walking out of this with the, with the spirit of tikkun alam. Again, I can't go into my work as an African-American and scholar of our history without drawing on Jewish values that say we can, you know, things have been bad, but we can do better. We can do better now. We can do better in the future. And we can do better the way we look at our past. So going into these, these places, the dread hits you. And it's not just, it's not the internal like, oh, it was me. It's, it's like, oh, wow, there's a lot of people here. And I think people realize that, you know, African-American bones from that, that time period are all over this country, it's, but especially the American South and the Eastern seaboard. Our graves get made into, go into golf courses and our graves get made into hunting grounds and our graves get made into, you know, the parking lots beneath gas stations. And it's, I mean, I remember watching when I was much younger, a documentary on PBS, Public Broadcasting Service in America, and it was about the Shoah. And one of the things that got me, I mean, moved me, not just to tears, but just made me gut-wrenching gut to me was when they, they're walking down a street in Poland and it looks like it's cobblestone. It's not cobblestone. The guy pulls out a pocket knife and he goes around and he shows that what looks like cobblestone is actually all the grave, the cemetery gravestones of people going back centuries in the Jewish community. And you're just like, how, and they already killed the killed our people. Then they do this, and so for me, it's about reclamation. It's about you know I pour libation. I know that I know that sounds to some people okay. That's not exactly okay. Whatever, it's my practice, and it and it helps me bridge the two worlds. And um, you know I talk to them, and there's been times when I when I'm finished working and I just sit there and cry. But I had a friend tell me, so was, you know, reality is, is that you're doing healing work. Yeah. And, that, and that these people have been forgotten and you're, you know, you're saying their names, you know, um, long before say, your, say their names became a theme in American, a, 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 a motto for, for social justice in America. I was already saying the names of anybody who was remembered on these plantations, especially the cooks and their families, but everybody I could say before I even began my work in after. Mm -hmm. And you really, and Alyssa, I gotta tell you something, it's, it's kind of, it's gonna sound extremely weird. I'm gonna go there with you because, we, because we're friends. Um, you have to like shake them off when you leave a spot. Mm -hmm. You've opened the door, you gotta close that door and mm -hmm. close it shut. And you gotta say, you gotta say, you gotta say I love you and goodbye and uh, you know, be well, I'll see you next time, da da da. But um, the reality is, is that now that you are the storyteller, now that you're the griot, now that you're the messenger, now that you're the person who opens that door, they love you. Mm. Love you a little bit too much. Mm. Like, you know, we, we assume that the, our, our ancestors are like, you know, angelic. Mm. They are in some ways, but you know, it's like in, it's like in, it's like in um, Yiddishkeit, the folklore of Yiddishkeit about Shedim, about ghosts, Mm. And about spirits is that remember the dibbuk? The dibbuk is there for a reason, right? Yeah. Because there's that idea that, and, it, and it's and okay. So if you're not met, if you're not into all that, I understand. But I'm going to put it to you on a different level, just on the level of human experience and memory. Mm. The idea of the dibbuk is there because it's a restlessness of the soul, mm. but it's also the restlessness of trauma. That trauma is going to be there whether you think. It, you think there's this thing spiritual about it or not? Yeah. So the, the idea behind it is that the trauma will get you. The trauma will, will hold on to you and hold you hostage. Yeah. And you need to figure out a way to deal with that. So for me, the self-care part is extremely important because I realize I need to come down off the energy that I'm putting out. I need to chill out. I need to, to kind of cleanse some of the things that I've heard and and seeing and things that come through me, I need to do all that. And I need to also express my gratitude. 
gratitude for being a free person, a free man of color, gratitude for not having had to live it, gratitude for the debts that have been paid for me to be here, gratitude for you know knowing that nothing in my life, nothing in my life could ever equal 30 seconds in their existence, the way they lived it. Um, and their blessings too. I don't wanna make this also like a, a drain or a drag because they're, they're my board of directors, my ancestors, you know? And they are, they're, they're also a great help to me. And, and they help, they calm me down. They help me, they help me understand why I'm here. I've always been connected to them, always. Always. Um, my great, my grandmother's sister used to call me the Obi child. <laughs> uh, Obeya is, a, is one of the New World African spiritual traditions, but it's, it was it not, not the nicest way of using it, you know, but um, I, I feel like, I feel like that's always been a part of me and, and it helps me get through teaching about the, the trauma and the triumph, you know. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. A bit of, a bit of metaphysical, spiritual woo-woo. <clears throat> it's important, you know, to have, have a bit of it in your life, I think. Um, that resonates. Um, so my next question. Okay, coming into history in the real world a bit, um, you, there are so many interesting culinary figures and personalities in your book, um, so many. And But there are a couple that I just found really interesting and who I think are really emblematic of a lot of the kind of the food history that is either lost or overlooked or people don't know about. So I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about James Hemmings and Abby Fisher, because I think sure. most people won't know, in the audience won't know who, the, who they are. So... Um... Keep in mind that in, in the United States, to be enslaved in many places meant that you were not allowed to read or write. When I say not allowed, I don't mean a tap on the hand. I mean punishable by sale or by death. So to have people who come out of enslavement who are able to read and write, or in Abby Fisher's case, dictate to someone else to write their, their stories and their recipes is very important. Uh, let me start with Abby Fisher. Let me go backwards. Abby Fisher was um, from South Carolina, um, brought to Alabama, and then made her way after enslavement to um, San Francisco. In fact, Omnivore Books, one of my favorite places, uh, uh, cookbook stores and you know independent bookstores, is not very far, um, a couple steps away from where Abby Fisher had her Butcher shop, butcher shop and um, and catering business. She was um, a feisty middle-aged black lady um, with the old-fashioned circle glasses, could cook anything, and had her had one of the first African American cookbooks. What Mrs. Um, Fisher knows about old Southern cooking, um, and just the fact that she she tells several different stories, antebellum slavery. Um, the re the different regions of the American South that she represents, both the Low Country and the Gulf Coast, and then the the, the first efforts at migration out of the South to other places for opportunity and for a better life. I mean, what we call the Great Migration in America, the largest um, forced migration in American history was the domestic slave trade, and the largest free will migration within America was the Great Migration of African Americans which happens in different waves, right after the Civil War, turn of the century, and then sustained from 1910 to 1940. So from World War I, basically to World War II. And then after, the, after World War II, from 40 to 70. And then after some you see like a reverse migration. Just to give everybody a perspective on that. Um, no African-American family is untouched by those two experiences. That's how massive these parts of our history are. And then of course, James Hemings was enslaved to Thomas Jefferson. But you know, Thomas Jefferson, I think a lot of people around the world know about the story about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. First of all, she wasn't his girlfriend. Uh -uh. She was chattel that he took advantage of and she was, was a kid. She was uh, a teenager. She wasn't even 18 years old. And um, furthermore, the, the, he had a number of children with her which they denied until DNA showed that yeah, he's 
probably most likely the candidate for being the father of her children. But beyond that, um, she's also his wife's, his widow, his dead, sorry, his dead wife's half sister. And so is James Simmons. Yes, they're related. They have the same father, John Wales. And James Hemings was his wife's half brother. So if you take that in consideration, when I talk about the cooking gene, I mean it. Mm -hmm. All these stories are in, yep, all these stories are intertwined, they're connected and they're important. James is 18 when Jefferson takes him and Sally to France, when he's ambassador in Paris. And um, he immediately, you know, sets James to learning to cook and learning French. And James becomes fluent in French. Jefferson never actually does. And um, he also goes to learn to cook at the, and in Paris and, in, and at the court at Versailles. And James is extremely um, enamored. They're both enamored with, with Paris because technically they're, 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 they're paid servants. They're not enslaved. He's not allowed to you know, treat them like they're enslaved people when he gets into France. That's not a thing. Um, and furthermore, they're like wearing these beautiful clothes and they're doing these beautiful things. They're going to parties and dances. And it must have been ex exhilarating to go from the cloistered world of Virginia plantation to this space where, you know, you're in the most exciting place in the entire planet, you know, on the verge of revolution. And you're, you're at the most extraordinary resplendent court. And so he absorbs all of that. He learns how to cook. He becomes this, this master chef. He has more training and more everything that any chef in America had. I mean, these were, a lot of these chefs in America were indentured servants who were trying to use their craft to get out of indenturedhood, you know. Um, they, and some, some of them weren't much better off than him in some ways. But the bottom line is nobody has his training and his, his panache. And of course, Jefferson paired with him is like a visionary. And he, he's trying to, Jefferson is actually, along with Adams and Ben Franklin, trying to craft an American culture and, and existence that is separate from Great Britain, but not too separate. And then the other part of it is that they're trying to understand the role that people like James and his old black people play in that. I mean, it's, it's not to be understated that those, that first generation of revolutionary black Americans, et cetera, they were, tw first of all, they were one of every four people you would have met in colonial America. And they were from all the way from Maine and Massachusetts down to the Florida border and inward. And second of all, the Native American and African cultures in, in general, I'm speaking, were really critical to sort of shaping the, the, the diet, the language, the food, I mean, everything. I mean, the one of the biggest complaints that, that the Brits made about Americans and it's a, was it a complaint or is it an observation that to the extent that they were connected to these brown and black people, that's what made them different from the mother country. This, they would say the same thing about whites in Jamaica. Mm. Like Y'all are different because you hanging around these guys, they teach you different things. But especially when you hit the Maryland border and you move south towards the Florida border, it was very apparent that their, their culture. So James comes back and James creates this table that uh, um, one person described as half Virginian and half French in style with food served in good taste and abundance. So when they say Virginian, they're talking about us. They ain't talking about nothing else. Um, so yeah, I mean, people like him get forgotten, but they're the ones who really made American culture what it, what it is, what it was. And part of it was that bridging of those worlds you know, intersectionality doesn't start with, with millennials and Generation Z. It starts with the beginning of history. Mm. And people like James Hemings were those kind of border crossers that made culture happen. I definitely want, the, when I read about James Hemings, I was like, I want the Netflix series of this story, like multiple seasons. Write a script. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, so, um, uh, now my, my next question is coming even further into the present towards, you know, where we are now. Um, could you tell us a bit about your Jewish culinary influences? Because 
You uh, mentioned in the book lots of Jewish women who have shaped you and mentored you and taught you a lot of what you know today. Right. Um, all the books that Faye Levy put out, all the books that Claudia wrote, and I had the opportunity to meet Claudia Roden several times. Mm. And um, <laughs> the funniest thing I remember about her is that, number one, having dinner with her and sitting side by side, which kind of breaks down a menu. There was a there was a group of Israeli Arab, uh, Israeli Jewish, and um, and and Palestinian and Druze chefs, mm. and of course the Israelis came. The Israeli Jews came from all over, backgrounds from all over Ethiopian, Russian, but especially Middle Eastern, Sephardi, Mizrahi, and some Ashkenazi, and it was fascinating. All these chefs working together. There was. There was no matzav out the window. I mean, like there was this, like it was like this internal bubble. And she's breaking down these stuffed foods and other foods, and explaining to me. And I mean, you know, it, it was very intimate because you know, every now and then her hand reaches over and you know, holds my hand as if to say, "I'm guiding you through this." And she went. I remember one time I was trying to take a picture with her, and she said, um, "Michael, you know, we Egyptian ladies are very vain." So you must get my be my best side, <laughs> and I just I just thought that was so fun, and um, Joe Nathan, American mm. Jewish cookbook author, she lives we're, we're neighbors practically. We live in the same metropolitan area, DC area, and she was very very eager and very um, generous with her time to really sort of like get me through. And also, I, I mean, I read a book she ever wrote. Mm. Um, and Marcy Cohen Ferris, mm. um, a friend of hers, uh, she is the author of Matzo Ball Gumbo and the Edible South, a Southern Jewish food scholar and a great, fantastic mentor to me. Mm. Someone who has really been on, in my corner um, this whole time. And I met these folks 20 years ago. It's not recent. This is like a long mm. time ago, over 20 years ago. Mm. I, I couldn't even drink when I met these ladies, <laughs> really. Um, Claudia more went more when I was older. No, definitely. But Joe Nathan and Marcy, yes. Um, and I guess a big for and of course I got to meet Rabbi Gil Marks of mm -hmm. Blessed Memory, one of the one of the one of the great scholars of Jewish food. Um, may he rest in peace. Um, I love a shalom. But um just to sort of be around these folks and absorb, it's just like, okay, what's my next step? What is how do I tell uh, about my chapter in Jewish food? Well, first of all, I think I wanted to say that um, for me, Jewish food means the entire display of Jewish food culture. Mm. And, and the import of Jewish, the, the fact of the matter is our food text, you know? Um, my, own, my own ancestry, my, my um, little piece of, of Jewish ancestry goes back to um, Eastern Europe and the Ukraine. Um, then again, a genetic genealogy, but again, if the people expect you to have like this, you know, line by line, well, that doesn't happen in the lives of new world black people. I mean, we just, we have blood and genes and histories from everywhere. And it just, you know, <laughs> you get a new piece and it's a, it's a part of you. But for me, like there is, there's three kinds of cooking. I'll break it down like this before we go to Q and A. Um, one is, one is the experience of that interpreter vibe in me of being authentic, um, of really reading about, I'll read, I'll read about 10, 20 recipes that I think are really strong and really rooted in the tradition. And then I average out, number one, the first question I always ask is what am I actually gonna eat? Cause I'm picky. And then after that comes, okay, cool. Let's get this, you know, get this done. Um, and so I'll source the right ingredients. Sometimes when I've had a garden, I'll go to the, le the level of growing. So for example, I'll grow tomatoes that came out of Ukraine or Russia mm. or carrots that are from, you know, Germany, or I'll, I'll really try to grow the food that most matches the area. Mm. And so use those ingredients to make it, and make, it makes a complete difference. I realize the soil is not the same. There are other climatic elements of the same, but when you have the, the, you know, certain types of vegetables and you, you know, you have um, really high quality kosher meat, et cetera, the result is fantastic. And it, and there's something very, I think it's very similar to the work I do in the plantations, right? Because I have this feeling, this, this intuit, this, this empath feeling that 
when I make these recipes, the people who, the, um, the, the souls, the shamas, of the people, the people, the food that comes from, mm. they're with me, okay? Mm. So, you know, one of the, my favorite challah is the Bago family challah that Joe Nathan wrote about in one of her cookbooks, The Foods of Israel. And it's the best challah recipe I've ever had, you know, mm. homemade. But it's from a family that was that was almost de completely decimated by the sh by the Shoah, mm. and so you can't not make the food and not think about that every time. Mm. But beyond that, there's what I call my Afro Ashkafardi cooking, <laughs> where I mix everything up, everything you know, you know, the all meal, and nothing, nothing is no stone is unturned, everything's up for grabs. Mm. And then when I make when I make you know traditional food that I grew up with, in my home it's kosher. Mm. But in museums, it may not be kosher because I'm not, it's not about me. It's about the place that I'm in. Mm. And I think it's very funny, you know, especially, I know there's a lot of, you know, practicing Yehudim who are just like, no, 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 make it kosher. I'm like, no, that's not, it's ahistorical. Mm. It's not accurate. Even for Southern Jews, ladies and gentlemen, most of whom chose not to practice kashrut because to do so would have further alienated them from their neighbors. Mm. Um, however, I do have some records and, and research about Jewish families that did keep kosher. And that fascinates me because what's interesting is that if you look at their account records, the enslaved folks that, that were working in those households were able to have like crabs and crawfish and other things and oysters in their habitations, but not in the kitchen. So they would buy those things for them yeah. And then you would expect them. To, so this person, his person who was, you know, I, I guess in Savannah, for example, uh, from Africa or one or two generations removed, that's it, was also having to master Kashrut. Mm. And that's, to me, that is like an explosively fascinating story that doesn't often get told. Yeah. But certainly the women who cooked for Black, for black women who cooked alongside and for Jewish households, particularly Ashkenazi households in the South, they're the ones who invented the matzo ball gumbo. They're the ones who invented black eyed peas and kishka, the matzo meal, fried chicken, et cetera. So all those three types of cooking, African diaspora and Southern and Caribbean and uh, Afro-Latin, and then strictly, you know, old world Jewish, and mm -hmm. then a mixture of, the, mixture of all of the above. And of course, all the above doesn't just mean Europe, it means, mm -hmm. Jews of India, black folks in India, Jews of China, black folks in China. Oh yeah, it goes back back to the beyond the Middle Ages, by the way. Mm. All those stories are part of how I make my table. Mm. Yeah. Oh, we're we're running out of time, and I've still got so many more questions. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking. Well, I want to just touch quickly on Pesach, which is I don't want to freak anyone out, but Pesach is about two and a bit weeks away, it's, it's very soon. Um, so you, I was wondering if you could tell me in your ideal world, it's not a pandemic, you can have everyone over for Seder, you can put on a beautiful meal. What are you gonna make? And could you name three people living or dead that you would like to have at your Seder table? Okay, so let me go with the the people first because mm. that one's harder a little bit harder um larry kramer mm -hmm. who was um who just passed away last year not from COVID, but from natural causes long long lived and long survived uh hero um and some some would say villain of the aids crisis like he he made sure that this country did not forget um, that it was losing entire generations through negligence. You know, uh, somebody like me, even, even those of us who are not positive, my, um, my former partner was positive. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that he, he's still here and the fact that I'm still here and the fact that as an HIV negative person and the fact that we can exist is because people like Larry Kramer mm -hmm. advocated Mm. for the survival of, you know, um, gay men in particular, but all people with HIV AIDS and, mm. the, and, and the partners and allies and friends and family. Um, I would also uh, probably have um, James Baldwin mm. at my table. Um, 
America's, you know, one of the most celebrated authors and civil rights activists, black gay man, mm. prolific. And um, I guess I need to have some people who I really want to ask a lot of questions of, including my two favorite um, stories, the, um, the maid of Lublin, who was also a rabbi, she was a, in Poland, she was a, she was a woman who took on the status of a, of a, of a, of a spiritual leader. Mm. And of course, Asenath Barzani, who was a woman who lived in, um, you know, the 17th century, I think 16th, 17th century, one or two, I'm sorry. And um, what is now Iran slash Afghanistan, she was um, a Kurdi Jewish um, rabbi. Mm. One of the first women to, to, to play that role uh, uh, and also a Rosh Yeshiva. Mm. So, I mean, until the, there weren't, there weren't a lot of men folk who had those skills. She was the daughter of rabbi, she knew her stuff. Mm. And so I kind of like by having these kind of like outliers board across, board across as an iconic class, I, I kind of want to find out more about, I'm kind of selfish. I want to find out more about myself. Mm. What would I make? Oh my gosh. I got to make mm. my West African brisket. The recipe is in the cooking gene. I would make, um, I kind of like the idea of having matzo balls on their own. Mm. Even though I love matzo ball soup. And I make matzo balls with a little bit of green, green onion, scallion, and hot pepper in them in the center and spices. Mm. Um, kind of eat that with whatever, you know, sauces around. And so the last um, surprise you bite in and you don't think it's going to be hot, but then there's a, like a little yes. spice in the center. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that, that comes out of, it, that's kind of like, Cajun meets Lithuanian. Mm. Um, and um, I don't know. I love Salatim. Like was one of those one of the things that kind of like I had to change up when in in becoming deeper a part of the community was the Salatim. Was the idea that you know you had like the Moroccan one with carrots and you had cucumbers over here. And it, you know, there's some of that in Southern cooking, but once you kind of bridge those two worlds. And it's more vegetable focused, plant, you know, plant based forward thing. Um, so yeah, I mean a lot. I mean, I could go on and on and on. My of fried chicken is to die for. And um, I'm not big on desserts on pesa, mm -hmm. but I do make a Caribbean capote, which is made with um a slight pinch of cayenne, not a lot. You won't really feel mm. it that much. Cinnamon, vanilla, mm. mango, pineapple, all kind of good things. So yeah, it's 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 I, I could make a meal that would last till the Mashiach comes. <laughs> Amen. That'd be that'd be nice. Amen. Um, there's and also I should mention to people listening that though the cooking gene is not a cookbook, there are recipes in it. Um, and there's there's you've got a recipe for brisket in here. There's the black eyed peed hummus. Um, there's there is some cooking inspiration in there. And actually, speaking of which. Um, I might just sneak in one more question before going to some audience questions. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the projects you're working on right now? Because I understand that there is a book about your Jewish identity coming up and potentially yeah. a cookbook as well. Yes. So I am working on Kosher Soul right now, which hopefully, hopefully, my God, will be out next year. And it's taken a long time because given our, our past political history in the past couple of years, um, there have been a lot of flashpoints, mm. um, which is to say that there've been there's been stuff between Black Jewish relations. There've been stuff with just the, the racial strife in America. There's been stuff with Jewish identity and and um, violence against the Jewish community here in America. And then, of course, the election of John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock in Georgia, which was earth shattering. Mm. You now, first Ju first Jewish and first. Um, black senator from the state of Georgia. Mm. Um, and, you know, Pat, George, those who don't know, Georgia and Atlanta are powerhouse parts of not only the American South, but America, period. Um, a lot of, lot of money, a lot of commerce, and a lot of, you know, history with civil rights. So to have a, you know, Jewish man and a black man represent Georgia as senators, both Democrats, you know, this is earth shattering. So all that goes has gone into Kosher Soul and that journey, interviewing other Jews of color, Jews of African descent about their food traditions, 
Yeah. Going through my own Jewish journey, all that's been very important. So that comes out soon. And then of course, Rice, aha, uh -huh, is mm -hmm. right now um, through UNC Press. And it's uh, strictly about rice recipes from the American South. Yeah. So I'm doing a lot. I have a, I'm working on a show right now. I'm working on, a, I have a line of spices um, yeah. I've coming out. I mean, a lot of stuff going on because, you know, to be a, this is a really hard time for all of us around the globe, but especially in this country. I assure you that a lot of people have never seen anything like this in terms of um, health issues mm. and financial woes. Mm. And so for, to, to survive in this climate, you got to do a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I think we need to wrap up now. I'm sorry. We got a lot of, we got some questions that were kind of answered in the course of our conversation and a lot of comments just saying how interesting the conversation has been. Um, so I'm going to just say thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. This is really illuminating and hand the reins back over to Nick who will tie things up. Oh, wow. I'm, so, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, but I hope that hope that kosher soul will answer them. You'll hopefully yeah. you'll come back you'll to Australia. Back. Yeah, in, right in, in person, in person, as we was talking before. No, I mean, I mean. Um, Michael and Lisa, thank you so much. What a what an invigorating, um, dynamic exploration of, of history and culture and and trauma and feast and and famine. I, I'm I'm absolutely buzzing. There's so much to think about and and to remember. Um, it was an absolute joy. Um, so thank you. Alyssa says she wants a Netflix series. Michael, I thought maybe you should um, <laughs> start talking to Lynn manuel Miranda about a sequel to Hamilton. It's, it's, it's almost- Oh, Hemmings, yes. I love <laughs> it. Um, so thank you. I mean, that was, that was so enjoyable. Um, just to our audience out there, as I said at the very beginning an hour ago, um, just bear with me just for a couple of minutes. Our next three events all offer something um, uh, a little different to our norm. Um, next month, on the third Tuesday, just for the once instead of the second Tuesday, um, we're going to be presenting our first open mic event. And this is an event that gives you the opportunity to read a short piece of, of your own work or just to be part of an appreciative audience supporting those who are willing to, to take that challenge up. Um, submissions close on Tuesday 6th of April, two weeks before the event. Um, and, and, and then I'll be in contact with, the, with those that we um, uh, with as many as possible to fit in. Go to our website to, to submit a piece or, or to book. This, this really is a, a community event. So please support and encourage each other in this endeavor. Um, our May event um, will feature two absolute international heavyweights of Jewish writing and thought. Um, we're gonna reveal their identities in, in an upcoming newsletter. Um, but they're going to be joining us for what is going to be the official launch of the Jewish Quarterly uh, journal now owned and published uh, in Australia by uh, Maury Schwartz. Um, and this world-renowned journal gathers the world's best minds and, and, um, and uh, spanning cultures, continents, um, digging into topics um, that are thematically relevant to Jewish culture. Um, it's, um, as I said, it's going to be operated out of Australia now, distributed worldwide. You're going to hear a lot more about this and about um, special subscription offers just for the Melbourne Jewish Book Week community. But believe me, when you see the names we've got for our May event, uh, you won't want to miss that one. And then just very quickly, one more minute, guys, that's all I promise. Um, in June is an extravaganza. It's a gala event featuring eight Australian and international guests performing commissioned original pieces on the theme fake it till you make it. This event was due to, believe, was due to be a, um, a live extravaganza at last year's live festival, um, which unfortunately couldn't go ahead, but desperate not to let the idea disappear uh, into the ether. A great deal of effort has been put into providing as live and exciting experience as possible straight into your home. Our guests include Josh Cohen from the UK, Deborah Conway, Andrea Goldsmith, Elise Hurst, um, uh, and the host is the uh, irrepressible Ginger Gorman. It's going to be an, uh, an amazing event. So bookings for all of those um, events and more details can obviously be found through our website. Um, finally, I, I urge you to make a donation to Melbourne Jewish Book Week. You can, you can see how hard we're working to bring you the best of the best. So please support us and allow us to continue to do so. Um, details, details of how to donate will follow. 
Um, Michael, again, and Alyssa, thank you so much for thank you. such an enjoyable evening. And 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 Michael, we we do look forward to seeing you here in in, in person. And and stay safe. Um, and um, how can someone have so much energy at four thirty in the morning? I have no idea. I want a little bit of that. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Thanks, and, Michael. Good night to everybody and good evening. See everyone next month. Thanks, guys. Thanks Bye. all. Bye. Bye.